You know, whenever we're talking about video games, I think we tend to focus on two things most of the time. We focus on the hardware, and then we focus on the games themselves, the software. You know, but there's a third piece that is equally important. And I think, I mean, gamers recognize this, but we just don't talk about it as much as we should. And that's the controller. You could have the best game ever running on the most advanced platform, but if there's not a good way to control it, it's not going to be fun. The first video game, Computer Space, had four buttons. Now, it was the first game, so people weren't really used to it yet. So that was kind of one of the reasons why the game didn't do so well. Back then, even having four buttons on a Computer Space game was like sensory overload. They weren't really sure how to work those four buttons and use them at the same time. People did not have the same level of hand-eye coordination that we take for granted today. And then Pong came out, and it was just much easier to use. It kind of had a dial. It was just much more intuitive for people. Computers aren't really popular yet. People aren't really familiar with buttons. So knobs are kind of a little more common and a little easier to interact with. So that's why Pong really caught on because it was a game that was simple enough where people could just move back and forth, have fun, and not think about how they're interacting. And then by 79, Asteroids came out, and that actually had the same kind of four-button layout as Computer Space did, but by then, people were ready for it, and it was actually a huge hit. Long before joysticks and buttons were standard, every game had its own controls, be it a knob, some sort of trackball, a light gun, a wheel, everything was different. Atari 2600 comes out, and now the games are in the home. So now you have 100 different cartridges. You can't have 100 different controllers to really interact with the system. Them. You need one all-purpose controller that can play every type of genre, which introduced the joystick. Now the joystick had actually been around for like 70 years, it was an important part of early aviation, but the Atari 2600 made the joystick the international symbol for video games. So that was a great way to start. It wasn't the best controller in the world, but it was good enough to really help the 2600 take off. So the actual input stick on the control is only half the equation, the other half is the buttons. And the Atari 2600, they had one big red button on it, and that kind of worked okay, it kind of went where your thumb went. It took people a while to figure out where exactly the buttons are supposed to go on this thing. At first they thought a keypad, it should look like a phone, that's something with buttons. And you see that on the Atari 5200, on the Intellivision. It's obviously not correct. The problem with these square number pad style controllers is you can't look at the screen and just use your hands without seeing what they're doing. You have to really pay attention to what's going on. When people don't notice the controllers, that means that they're really doing their job. It's kind of a seamless integration because you're not thinking about what you're doing. It's just coming naturally. The Intellivision controller had a disc you moved like this and then all these buttons that were kind of laid out, kind of like an iPod mixed with a phone, but not nearly as good as an iPhone. So when Nintendo came in and wanted to reinvent the home console market with the NES, they said, hey, you know what? We gotta reinvent the controller also. We have to make a clean break with the past. So what did Nintendo do to reinvent the controller? Well, they looked at the Game & Watch series. There was these little boxes that you play one little game on, and one of them was Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong on the Game & Watch had a D-pad, and the D-pad allowed Mario to move up, down, left, right. So they decided, hey, that's a really good idea. That'll really shake up things a little bit. When people first saw that, they were like, oh, this is gonna be so much more complicated than a joystick. How can you have like a little pad as soon as people got their hands on it, it was immediately recognizable and understandable. The same year that Nintendo came out, Atari was coming out with the 7800, which stuck with the joystick. So you can clearly see 7800 stuck in the past, Nintendo's gamepad moving to the future. So at this point, games were starting to get more complicated and deeper, so you needed more ways to interact with them. What do you do? You add more buttons. The NES controller had two buttons, the Genesis had three buttons, the SNES had six buttons, it even added the first shoulder buttons. Those went right where your fingers went. One of the defining moments, I think, in terms of the video game controller was this popularity of these complex fighting games, specifically Street Fighter 2. That thing had six buttons and a joystick. When Street Fighter 2 was released for the home consoles, uh, that was kind of the peak of the Super Nintendo Genesis rivalry. And one clear advantage the Super Nintendo version had was that it had the proper amount of buttons, which is why Sega released their own six button controller halfway through the console's lifespan. I think that is what set a lot of the video game industry toward we gotta make more complex controllers and games that are really geared toward hardcore gamers. So now the button revolution begins. It's like more buttons, more buttons, more buttons. That means better, faster. That means our system's better than yours because we have more buttons. So the Atari Jaguar attempted to solve the button problem, but they did it by bringing back that old square keyboard style. But again, our hands are not waffle irons and that just didn't work. By the Jaguar having a gamepad like Coleco or Intellivision, you're resurrecting a failed experiment. It didn't work then. 
what makes them think it's gonna work now? So the next big revolution in game controllers, that was the N64 from Nintendo in 1996. We were starting to get into very immersive virtual worlds and the old D-pad just wasn't cutting it. You could do up, down, left, right, but that's not enough for a 3D world. Nintendo introduced analog control, which is actually bringing the joystick back in a smaller form that could give players more nuanced control over what they were doing. The analog controller pretty much replaces what would be 360 buttons because you have a 360 degree POV. It's not that we need more buttons, more buttons. It's that we need a better way to interact with the game without adding more buttons. So the Dreamcast was the first controller that had two analog triggers on it. That's really important because when you think about things, you're not either off or on. There's a range of motion and the analog controls allow you to translate that mental range of motion into the game. When you get in a car, you're not just going fast or stop. There's not just two speeds in your car. Instead of the X button being on or off, it can be in a thousand different states. It's like, would you rather have 20 different buttons to control the lights in a room or a dimmer switch? In 1997, PlayStation released the controller that has two analog sticks. So now you can have that same movement, 360 degrees, with both thumbs. Now that allows you to have first person point of view, move one way on the like XY axis and move the other way on you know the Z axis. And this two analog analog input device becomes the norm. Eventually they realized that controllers didn't have to just send information to the TV, the TV could send information back to the controller and they invented rumbling in games, force feedback. The things happening on screen would sometimes shake your controller. So it's now keeping them in the game even more because when you get hit, you're like, whoa. Wow, my controller just shook. I'm not just passively playing now, I'm actually getting a response. Very advanced technology, you take a motor you unbalance it so it's broken, and then you make it whir like hell. So we always want our video game controllers to be very physical. One physical thing we don't like, though, is tripping over the cords and falling down. People have always wanted wireless controllers for their game consoles. We're not that far away from people looking back at old pictures of video game consoles and being like, you had wires on your controllers? But uh, for the longest time, there was a mess of wires, and you had to wrap them up when you were done playing or your mom got angry. Nintendo keeps pushing things forward by releasing the WaveBird for the Nintendo Cube in 2002. And the WaveBird is the first wireless controller that really gets it right. Because instead of using IR, infrared, it now uses radio waves. So that allows the controller to be moved all over the place and you have no wires, you don't have to point it directly at the system. The point of good controller design is so you never have to think about the controller. It's interesting how video game controllers evolve and the new ones would be unrecognizable if you took them back 25 years. And you know what? I say f yeah. Up until now, we've been talking about translating your physical movements through buttons and analog sticks and triggers into the game. What if you could take your actual physical actions and do what you want to do on screen? If you could swing a tennis racket or throw a bowling ball or swing a sword, that's what the Nintendo Wii does. It makes you the input device. It's not just a set of buttons anymore, but uh, there's unlimited possibilities where you can move it around in space and towards and from the TV. If the idea of a controller is to become completely transparent to the point where you forget about it, then the Wii is clearly where we're going. The Nintendo Wii controller, it's not quite there yet, but for taking your actions and translating them into the game, it's a very important first step. Controllers used to be simple and then they got complicated, but now they're almost reverting back to simple. There's very few buttons on the Wii. Because it's just like anything, it's cyclical. You know, there are times when it was really simple with the joystick, got really complex with, you know, Dreamcast, and then it starts coming back down, and the Wii now is in like the low spot where it's very simple to interact with. There's always been this sort of tension between simple control and complex. I mean, you can look at it from the very beginning, right? It's consistently swung back and forth. And as control schemes have veered toward the simple, they've actually brought in new players as they veer to the complex. They actually get already engaged players engaging in, in, in new ways and in more ways. The 360 controller, for example, is meant for people who grew up with video games who now know how to play and navigate all these buttons. On the other hand, you've got the Wii, which basically all it requires is you to move a wand around with nothing else at its simplest, which is accessible to anyone from senior citizens to like six-year-olds. It's almost a completely different thing. It's like, how do you compare something like Gears of War to like Wii Sports? It's They're, they're, they're so un incomparable. Like, that to say you're into games now, you, got, you have to specify. Like, you wouldn't say you're into movies, you say you're into action movies. And I think that's kind of where we're going. I enjoy watching it all evolve. Like, I like sitting back and seeing like, wow, where are these things gonna go? You know, there's definite arguments that being simple is better and being more hardcore is better. It's just the type of gamer you are.